Hi, hey everybody. Today I'm going to talk about hybrid stars, and in particular, a type of object called a thorn zipkow object, a TZO. This is where a red giant star hosts in its core a neutron star. Uh, these are probably pretty rare, but there may be between 20 and 200 such objects in our Milky Way. Um, and uh, out of the 40 billion or so stars, that makes them pretty rare. So where could they come from? Well, perhaps a wandering neutron star might happen upon a red giant and they might uh, collide with each other. That's going to be quite rare unless we're in a very crowded area, such as a globular cluster shown on the top right there, or perhaps a uh, center of the galaxy, somewhere where the stars are very much more packed together than they are out where we are with the sun. It could form from binary stars where the pair of stars evolve through their life and uh, one of them detonates as a supernova and then that leaves behind a neutron star. And as a result of the supernova, it disrupts the orbit of the pair such that the neutron star spirals in too close and collides with the outer atmosphere of its red giant companion um, and the drag from hitting that atmosphere would very rapidly cause its orbit to decay and it would spiral in through the core of the star right into the center um, and uh, so that's another possibility but so uh, they would soon merge in both cases down to this hybrid star with the neutron star in the core and the overlying regions of the star looking to all intents and purposes like a red giant. Now as I said these were predicted by two astronomers, Kip Thorne, very famous Nobel Prize winner for physics, done a lot of work on black holes, and Anna Zitkow, I've met Anna, she's based in Cambridge here in the UK and is still active doing a lot of research. But back in 1977 they published this prediction that these strange hybrid objects might exist. Um, and it was a long time before we were really able to find out whether this was right or not. And we're still not entirely sure. So it might be quite surprising that a star containing a neutron star in the center would be stable at all. You would imagine that the neutron star would have material falling onto it and that it would be uh, crushing down to the enormous pressures um, inside the neutron star and converting it into more neutron star quite rapidly. Um, now, this is true, but actually the radiation from a lot of the surface of the neutron star as material falls in gets very hot and very high pressure, and it kicks off a lot of unusual nuclear fusion reactions that can't normally occur until you get to temperatures of a billion degrees or so. Um, and then the radiation released carrying that energy pushes outwards and tends to push material away, throttling back and limiting the rate at which material can accrete onto the neutron star. So they're stable for longer, perhaps, in theory, than you might think. But the vast amount of energy being released as a result of that um, strange nuclear fusion reactions triggered by the spark plug, the, the uh, neutron star right in the center there, changes the characteristics and the energy balance of the star. It's producing a lot more energy from the material that's falling into the center there than you would just get under ordinary circumstances. So this might give us something of a clue that uh, an outwardly ordinary red giant star might in fact host one of these strange neutron stars in the center. One of the things that's a real clue is the production by those peculiar nuclear processes of unusual rarer elements, elements that are not made under normal circumstances during the life cycle of an ordinary star. Stars carry out the nuclear fusion process, building up elements from hydrogen to helium, carbon, oxygen, all the way up to iron, shown on the diagram at the bottom right there, stellar fusion, the little red arrow at the bottom part of the diagram. But they're only able to go up to this position of um, iron and nickel in the uh, periodic table there, the first 
um, 26 or 28 elements. After that, all of the rest of the elements have to be produced by rather more exotic and much more energetic processes, such as the collision of neutron stars or the explosion of supernovae as the core collapses down. Uh, these generally release a blizzard of neutrons and you get the neutrons bombarding the existing nuclei and they rush up that rather colorful diagram all the way up to the heavier elements, up with things like lead and uranium and so forth produced in these uh, uh, pro violent processes. But what you tend to not get is some of the elements like rubidium, molybdenum, yttrium and zirconium. Those oddball elements are fairly rare, but the theory is that because of the violent conditions inside a TZO object, you would get quite a lot of these medium weight proton rich nuclei made in the so-called rapid proton capture process, the RP process that's uh, marked on the diagram there, caused by the, the uh, 1 billion degree temperatures at the surface of the neutron star boundary. It also is likely to produce a lot of lithium-7. And again, the high amount of radiation coming off this energetic uh, boundary layer can cause the outer layers of the star to fully convect so that the material made in the boundary layer, these strange fusion products, get brought up, dredged up to the surface and revealed in the spectrum of the light that we can see. And so this is a clue. We should look at the spectrum of these uh, uh, stars to see if this rapid proton capture process whereby protons smash into uh, nuclei and push them rapidly to higher and higher atomic number. So we've got a little extract of it here um, uh, where we've got arsenic turning into selenium um, and decaying and then being promoted to bromine and all the way up to krypton. But it produces a whole range of different elements going one at a time up through the, uh, the periodic table. And that's unusual in some ways because we normally go when we're doing ordinary fusion, we're adding a helium nucleus usually, and we go two steps at a time. You get a lot of the even numbered isotopes, but this process produces a complete range um, and that's where it's unusual. Now, these objects, of course, they don't live forever either. This is another reason why they might be rare. That material is falling in onto the neutron star inside this uh, outer envelope of the red giant. But gradually, uh, one of a number of things can happen. Firstly, the uh, shell of the red giant material can gradually be depleted and collapse down, forming a disk and uh, a bright and massive accretion disk around the outside of the uh, neutron star, exposing the neutron star from the top and bottom. You might get jets forming from the magnetic poles of the neutron star, um, but with a very powerful emission of hot x-rays and uh, so forth from the in-spiraling material in the accretion disk. Um, and it's also possible there might be enough material in that disk for that to re-accrete in the disk itself and form itself back into a companion orbiting star. So you'd have a neutron star with a very young star orbiting around it. And that would be interesting if we ever saw that because a neutron star is the end stage of a very old system. And uh, to have a brand new young star orbiting around it, it must have got there somehow. And that might be a clue that the system had been a TZO at one stage. Um, this is very similar in some ways to the moon forming around the Earth out of a probable disk that the Earth might have had after the big splat collision um, with the hypothetical planet Thea that formed the moon. But that's another story. The other possibility is that enough mass manages to fall onto the neutron star and it grows in mass and goes beyond 2.2 solar masses of neutron star, the so-called tolman oppenheimer volkov limit, um, at which the strength of the neutron matter that's holding it up 
against the crushing force of gravity is no longer sufficient and the whole thing would collapse down to form a black hole. And at that stage, again, we might have a black hole with an accretion disk or even a black hole with a young star orbiting around it. And so there are a lot of things, a lot of things we can go and look for in our galactic surveys to try and find these. But I think the most promising is definitely to look at the spectrum, to look for the uh, unusual chemical elements in that spectrum. We could also detect it from gravitational waves coming from the star. The effect of the neutron star in the center there, perhaps if it's still spiraling inwards, would be gravitational radiation. And it's also the case that actually the star will be too bright for its mass. So if we are able to measure its mass somehow, perhaps there's a third original member of the group that hasn't become absorbed and is still orbiting around. And we can see that the TZO candidate is in our binary system with another object. We might be able to use uh, Kepler's laws of planetary motion and our understanding of gravity to work out the mass of the TZO. And if we can also measure the distance and find the true power output, a long chain of reasoning, we can get to uh, a measure of the power output per unit mass of the star. And if that's too great, then perhaps we found ourselves a TZO with a neutron star lurking at the center. So what have we found? Well, there was a candidate for this, HV2112. This is a cool red star observed in the large Magellanic Cloud, the dwarf galaxy seen from the Southern Hemisphere that uh, orbits around the Milky Way. And it was first spotted in a survey of variable stars um, by Henrietta Leavitt Swan in 1908 when she was studying these uh, variable stars in the large and small Magellanic Cloud. She used those because the stars were all at the same distance and being at the same distance, part of this cloud, about uh, 200,000 light years away, uh, we could compare the brightness of them against each other and know that they were all the same distance from us. And that led to the discovery that you could use a class of stars called Cepheid variables as uh, standard candles, a technique that's used today. And Henrietta Leavitt Swan developed that. Well, she found this star and noted that it was a variable, but it wasn't a Cepheid and it wasn't one of the types she was looking for. So we then scrolled forward all the way to 2014 when Levesque argued that actually this particular star, having been catalogued, they noted that at that distance it was too bright for um, it to be an ordinary star. It's it producing over 100,000 times the luminosity of our sun. So a very, very much a powerhouse. Um, and she also spotted that it contained excesses of the elements lithium, molybdenum and rubinium, uh, rubidium that we've talked about before. These are unusual. They're not very common in ordinary stars. And uh, that goes back to the 1977 prediction by the likes of uh, Thorn and Zitkow of these uh, types of objects. Now, we're not sure. It's been disputed. 2017, Beza Davis et al. published a paper. The reference is on the screen there if you're interested. And they think this might be an ordinary uh, asymptotic giant branch star at an advanced stage of being a red giant where nuclear fusion of higher elements beyond helium and carbon is going on in the center of the star, um, perhaps accounting for some of the strange spectral lines that we see. Um, and there have been arguments about the distance and uh, a number of other factors calling into question the result. So is this a TZO? Maybe not. Still difficult to know. Also in the Large Magic Linux Cloud, there is another star, HV 11417, put forward by the same group and also disputed by Anna O'Grady. She thinks it's a much closer halo star. Um, again, it shows some of the characteristics of being a TZO, but um, she thought it was much, much closer to us and therefore not as bright, perhaps just in the line of sight rather than actually being in the Large Magellanic Cloud. 
Now, the Gaia satellite has just released its third catalogue of data, and this reveals that the distance is 103,000 light years. So that suggests that it is actually a long way away. Um, and uh, it also means that it's uh, perhaps a TZO. So the jury is still out on this one. These are perhaps two of the best candidates. There are three others. These names here, V595 Cassiopeia, uh, Io Persei and KN Cassiopeiae, that are possible TZOs reported in 2002. Um, we're not entirely sure. More work needs to be done to try and pin these down. It would be fascinating if we could confirm this theory and prediction of uh, Thorn and Zitkow. But moving on to another type of star that we've been observing for a while are Corona Borealis stars. Our Corona Borealis is the namesake star of a group of variable stars. Um, they are unusual in that they are yellow, but they're quite low mass yellow giant stars. So they're highly evolved stars. They've gone off the main sequence and they've formed um, red giant stars and then begun burning the helium to carbon and have produced quite a lot of carbon. And it seems that they produce the carbon as carbon dust in their atmospheres and this builds up and up and up causing the light to be blocked and the star to dim now of course when that happens it traps the heat and the uh, star can't get dump its heat to space so efficiently so it begins to build up the heat inside that triggers off more nuclear fusion and a burst of energy which blows the carbon dust away and then it settles back down again. And so you get this variable behavior. Now it's entirely possible that these things are also TZOs and that they contain a neutron star in the center. And it's possible that this is results from the merger of a neutron star and a white dwarf. So you might have had a binary system with a massive star that died and formed a neutron star after a supernova and a more sun-like star that had also died and formed a white dwarf. And they might spiral together, merge and flare up the neutron star's energy, uh, energization of the white dwarf, causing it to reburst into activity and again look like an Arcorona Borealis yellow giant. And there's a couple of examples where we suspect that is going on, U Aquarii and VZ Sagittarii. So have we discovered that these predictions of 1977 and the Thorn Zitkow objects exist? No, there are five known candidate stars, but um, it, watch this space. We may learn more about this as uh, technology improves. So thank you for listening, and I'll be back with some more hybrid stars in part two.